Okay, good morning, uh, everyone. I think it's time uh, we can kick off. So uh, I want to welcome everybody to this morning's webinar on uh, energy poverty and deprivation in Ireland. Uh, I'm Alan Barrett, the director of the ESRI, and it's a great pleasure to welcome everybody uh, here this morning. Uh, so as sometimes happens, uh, this report, I think, as everybody will notice, has got very significant uh, media attention already uh, this morning. Lots of discussion uh, about the findings. So we're looking forward to carrying on that uh, discussion uh, this morning. So I, I, I want to um, thank um, in, initially the Community Foundation for Ireland uh, for sponsoring uh, this work and in a moment we'll be hearing from uh, the, their CEO Denise Charlton uh, but it's been uh, fantastic. This is uh, I, I think the second report uh, that we're launching uh, under this program with the uh, Community Foundation and uh, it's been fabulous uh, for the Institute to be able to obviously for many years we've had a, a, a strong program of work in the area of poverty deprivation and those sort of matters uh, but it's been wonderful to receive additional funding uh, so we've been able to expand that research program and uh, as ever with re ESRI research the uh, the objective is to you know illuminate through data uh, some of the challenges that the, the country is, is facing sometimes it's uh, where our um, Conclusions are described as, as policy recommendations. We, we, we tend to try and call them policy implications. Uh, just to be very clear, it's, it's, it's really up to government uh, to make policy, uh, but we think it's very much the job of the ESRI uh, to almost sort of confront government uh, with, with, with the challenges to quantify these things, and then on occasions to, to, to quantify uh, how uh, different policy approaches have different impacts. Uh, and anyway, that the report today is very much in that um, tradition. So in a few moments, I'll be calling on the, the authors uh, of the report to, to um, give a presentation. Uh, we'll, we'll have hopefully maybe about 20 minutes or so for uh, Q&A. So uh, if questions strike you uh, as the presentation goes on, if you submit your questions to the, uh, the Q&A function, and uh, I'll try and moderate some discussion uh, later on, and then hopefully we'll, we'll uh, conclude the, the event at around 11 o'clock uh, this morning. So with that, it is my great pleasure uh, to welcome D Denise Charlton. Denise now uh, an, an old friend of the Institute um, and uh, becoming a closer friend uh, as we do uh, more and more of these launches. So great, great to see you, Denise, and uh, look forward now to your opening remarks. Great. Thanks, Alan. And welcome everybody to this morning's uh, conversation, which I think is a really important and timely one media commentator said to me this morning it's the conversation of the day the week and the future months so I think that's a, a result for ERSI and they're always ahead of the game in putting um, evidence um, and challenges to all of us not just government and um, I think that the report from the Community Foundation for Ireland's perspective as I said is really timely um, and we work a lot obviously with communities that are facing many challenges and what the report has really laid bare is that um, there are going to be increasing household challenges where when families are trying to balance their budget. Um, we hear from uh, the, the media reports um, of the findings and the work that's been done by RSI that fuel poverty levels now are in danger of reaching 43%. And if the energy prices continue uh, to increase the challenge, not just for government, but for all of us um, is really clear. We've been reflecting on that as a community foundation, um, and I just want to take a second to do that, what that actually means for many of the families that we're working with. It means that the prospect for four out of 10 homes could be in a very short period that people are deciding between food and warmth um, as they face the winter. Um, the figure is really even more significant, I think, um, when we see that it's double the previous high point recorded in the early 90s, and for older, for those of us um, that are, are here and remember the early 90s, it was a very difficult time. So double um, that point is, is pretty stark. And when you look at the cold, hard uh, numbers um, uh, and you turn that into cash, if we see a further 25% increase in bills, then the average household will see its, its weekly energy bill jump. Uh, up to around 37 euros and if you throw in petrol and diesel that could be 70 euros which is huge. Um, we know the global challenges that have got us here and brought us here and they're possibly out of our control but what we do about it is within our gift um, and we really hope that the policy implications that the RSI have put on the table do become very strong recommendations um, to government and that we respond as a country 
and um, with the lens to those that are, are most in need. Um, and then just looking, I suppose, at those policy implement implementations, impl impl uh, sorry, implications, um, and the possibilities. Um, so when you look at the URSI, they once again have shone a spotlight on the difficulties and the problem, um, as Alan says, facing our communities, but they have set out policy options. Um, and I really like a blueprint that can formulate an effective response by government and others. Um, noteworthy in the report is the acknowledgement that those households with the lowest income spend, um, obviously, uh, it's the greatest share of their money goes on fuel and that can't be ignored that has to be part of our response and um, we were very appreciative of the targeted response and um, that is recommended and not a blanket one and there are very key recommendations uh, that Barrow will go through that I won't go through but things like the enhanced Christmas bonus uh, and ex expansion of the fuel allowance but actually I think their their um, caution to us that um, a blanket response um, rather than a target response really blurs the messages um, around cutting back on, on fossil fuels. And as a foundation that has the climate emergency to the core of our work, that's a really strong message from the ERSI that we're very cognizant of. So that the fuel energy crisis isn't just about the economics and the hardship that families may chase, may face but also it will um, have implications how we deal with it not just for our generation for generations and um, to come um, and just then in conclusion uh, the other reason I suppose that this report is so timely is that many of the 5,000 organizations that we work with voluntary community organizations are preparing their pre-budget submissions um, and again these these policy and um, uh, recommendations from ERSI will be very important in the formation um, of those pre-budget submissions. Um, I suppose we hear also though, however, that budget uh, October 2023 might be too long or too late to actually take some of the findings on board and to be really thinking about the response to them. And we hope that government will do that uh, in the immediate term um, so that we're not uh, facing those challenges um, in October that they start already to start to think about how they set out those targeted um, actions sooner rather than later. Um, our mission is uh, equality for all in thriving communities. We've been lucky enough to be able to power um, donations and grant making of about uh, 100 million, um, and that's been possible by our donors. The reason the partnership with the ERSI is so important to us is that having top class research evidence and facts that backs up the evidence, uh, the testimonies, and the stories on the ground is really important to how we work with our donors. So we're delighted and I want to give a huge thank you to the ERSI, Michelle, to Niall, to Barra, and of course, um, Alan. And um, once again, you, you've brought evidence to the table that is so timely and important in terms of how we respond. And I really hope um, it is really informative and helpful to the government in their responses. It certainly will be to us. So thanks a million for, for all the great work. Great. Thanks so much, uh, Denise. And uh, again, appreciate the remarks and uh, but really appreciate the ongoing partnership uh, on the, this, this research programme. So with that, I'm uh, going to start handing over uh, to the authors. And great to say all three authors are going to be uh, presenting at different stages. So that's Michelle Barrett, Niall Farrell and Barrow Roundtree. Um, and are you going to kick off, Niall? I am indeed. Yep. Thanks, Alan. Brilliant. OK. And your, shares are sli uh, your slides are sharing and everything. So uh, perfect. Look forward to you. OK, well, thanks very much and thanks for, for the introduction. Um, so I'm going to kick off with just a bit of background to set the scene and uh, perhaps give some insight into the nature of energy poverty in Ireland uh, throughout the, since 1994. So what when it comes to energy poverty, we can think about it in many ways. There are different definitions that exist. And a lot of the stuff that Barrow will talk about will be related to maybe expenditure based methods. And that's essentially where we think about households expenditure as a proportion of their disposable income and a common commonly used threshold will be 10 percent share of disposable income and that sort of ca captures households for whom energy expenditures is, is is quite a burden and what, what we observe is in terms of their energy expenditure is a burden on, on, on in, relative to their income alternatively we could look at uh, self-reported metrics and that's basically a survey question to ask a household well how much um or have you had trouble heating your home or is it difficult for you to afford to heat your home? 
And these sort of questions basically capture um, a different aspect of, of energy poverty, as opposed to maybe a burdensome expenditure, uh, uh, an inability to, to, uh, to, to actually heat your home. And the first element of this report maybe compares the incidence of these two metrics to try and maybe understand a bit more about uh, the nature of energy poverty in Ireland and perhaps the types of responses that, that we tend to see across different uh, socioeconomic groups. So we chart the nature of energy poverty and we give two pieces of insight perhaps. One, of it, one is that I find quite interesting is to what extent are some poverty statistics, energy poverty statistics, uh, driven by perhaps insufficient heat and insufficient and maybe burdensome non-heat expenditure. So basically a lot of, when we think about energy poverty, we tend to think about um, the burden of, of heating your home, but there are other energy expenditures that tend to be, comprise energy poverty statistics. And to what extent is it driven by maybe electricity in general, as opposed to maybe heating related expenditures? So that's the first sort of insight, I suppose, that, that, that we can sort of maybe inform or, 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 or allude to when it comes to uh, energy poverty. The second one then is look at different types of socioeconomic groups and what type of households tend to respond um, from burdens and energy expenditures by just taking on board that, that increased cost and you know, shouldering that burden and perhaps having to forego expenditures in other parts of, uh, of the household. And then what sort of households tend to uh, respond by maybe being deprived of sufficient energy and going without su sufficient heat in the home. Okay, so the first thing we'll do is we look at the headline poverty statistics, and this is this will set the scene for uh, what context we when we see the the, the, the rising uh, poverty statistics uh, that Barrow will present, but also maybe give us some insight into, into the nature of energy poverty. So as you can see here, uh, since 1994, we've seen a decline from around 23 percent. To somewhere around 13% uh, for, um, well, from 2015, but I only present here to 2010, just to give you uh, the downward sloping trend that we've seen up to, to 2010. Um, if we compare that to energy deprivation, this is, so remember energy poverty, this red line, that's people who, the proportion of households in the population who spend more than 10% of disposable income on, on energy, including electricity. And then the purple line is those who report to say that, uh, it's difficult to, to afford adequate heat in the home or, or to just to heat the home. Um, and you see here, the, the trend tends to be much lower. So if we consider the energy poverty statistic and maybe take away the, the, the uh, expenditure on electricity, accounting, acknowledging the fact that most households uh, don't use electric heating. And for those who do use electric heating, they also use electricity on other services. So it's a rough a proxy of maybe the burden of, of, of energy expenditures. We see a very a much closer alignment. Um, now, of course, the same households don't necessarily incur energy poverty that incur energy deprivation. But one thing that it does sort of tell us is that the energy poverty statistics that we're, we, we tend to see, a lot of that is perhaps driven by electricity as opposed to maybe heat. And that's something that, that, could, be, uh, that, that, that could be worth exploring in the future. One thing I, I suppose in this section is there's probably perhaps as many questions as answers. And um, that's one, that, it's a nice thing that sort of sets us up for future work uh, to, to really tease out these things in, in much greater detail. And the final thing here on this, this trend is that while that slope tends to follow uh, since up as far as 2010, when you see the great recession period, uh, we see a slightly different trend. And when it comes to energy deprivation, we see a, a, a quite a, a peak during those periods uh, of households incurring greater degrees of energy deprivation. There's two perhaps explanations here. One is, well, we don't have the data on the same granularity when it comes to energy poverty, so there may be a data issue there. But secondly, maybe there's something about the nature of the constraints that um, the recession imposed on households that resulted in households responding by being deprived of energy as opposed to maybe incurring that cost. And that's something perhaps that uh, warrants further investigation as well. So going to the next, so the next section is to maybe look at rates of energy poverty and deprivation by different socioeconomic groups and try and get a feel for what groups tend to respond by burdens and energy costs by maybe just shouldering that burden and other households that maybe respond by being deprived of adequate heat in the home. So energy poverty, as we said, is households who, who consume 10% or more of uh, their disposable income on or spend on, on energy services. And we, we, we show the rates, so the rate in the population of homeowners and renters who experience energy poverty in this diagram here. 
And basically, the key message here is that it's pretty much the same. There's a little bit of variation around that, but the trend is, is um, it, 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 there's no discernible difference there. When we turn to energy deprivation, however, we see clear uh, situation where renters tend to have, there's a greater proportion of renters who experience deprava energy deprivation than homeowners. And there are many plausible explanations for this. It could be a thing that renters perhaps are at a different stage in the life cycle. Um, they're perhaps younger, they're not necessarily, don't have families or older people in the home. And if they're faced with increased energy costs, perhaps they're more inclined to, to, to cut back on heating, as opposed to maybe people with families who are much more conscious of making sure the house is, is warm. There, there are a few plausible explanations, but I def, this is something that definitely warrants a, a further investigation to, to, to maybe bring that out a bit more. The second thing then is to maybe disaggregate this by uh, dwelling type. And we see a similar type of, uh, type of pattern or perhaps a similar explanation for that pattern. Households, people who are in houses, for example, have greater rates of energy poverty rather than those who are in apartments or bed sits. But when we switch to energy deprivation, we see a flip in this case. Those who are in apartments or bed sits tend to, there's a greater proportion of those who are in energy deprivation than maybe those who are detached or semi-detached or terraced houses. What does this, um, what would this suggest? Well, it suggests that perhaps similar example here that those who are in apartments or bed sits are perhaps uh, more inclined to cut back on their energy. And that could be another life cycle type stage Type, type, type of explanation that, that could be behind this. The next thing we look at is, um, instead of looking at the rates of energy poverty, um, there's uh, this diagram here just tells us what is, um, if we take the, the headline energy poverty statistic and we decompose that by those who are at risk of poverty and those who are not at risk of poverty. When we look at energy poverty, we see that there's a good overlap with those who are at risk of poverty. And this is to be expected. If we, if we recall, energy poverty is calculated as a proportion of your income. So it's driven a lot by income. So a lot of households then would have captured by this measure are those households who have, have, have low income. So there's a, there's a considerable overlap uh, in this case. When you turn to energy deprivation, however, uh, there's much less of an overlap. And this is something that is perhaps unexpected, but I suppose it reflects maybe perhaps a situation where there's perhaps a lot more households that, well, there's many plausible explanations and something that, 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 that definitely uh, some, something that, 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 that needs further investigation. But one plausible explanation could be that it, it captures more dwelling type of situation as opposed to maybe income related hardship. And those who report uh, deprivation, it could be a situation where um, we're capturing those households who are really not necessarily people on lower incomes, but people who, who are in substandard uh, accommodation. One thing as well that I notice is that much of the rise around the Great Recessionary period is amongst those who are not at risk of poverty. And perhaps this says something about, again, going back to the response of households when it comes to that type of constraint that's imposed by, by, by the recession um, and how, how it, it leads to maybe uh, expenditure patterns uh, in the household. The final thing then that I'll present, and these are just a few snapshots that I think are quite interesting. The final one is decomposing um, energy poverty statistics by fuel type. And you see here, I suppose one key trend is that maybe if you go back to the 90s, a lot of people who are experiencing energy poverty, the primary fuel source was solid fuels. And we see that this is not necessarily, um, it's a much smaller proportion as we go into, into more recent times. And maybe that could be something about something associated with perhaps older households are, are um, more inclined to use solid fuels. And maybe as time has gone on, they're better looked after when it comes to maybe uh, better targeted with, with, with social transfers. The final thing I would, would highlight is that if we come up to maybe 2015, 2016, um, a good, about a two thirds of households who are experiencing energy poverty consume gas or oil. And that's around 10% of the population as a whole. These are the people who are exposed to the recent price increases. Um, and this is something that, that's perhaps uh, uh, quite, uh, quite, quite, quite interesting. And, but I suppose the next step then is to take that and to try and see, well, where does that stand bring 2015, 16 measures up to, up to the present day? And that's something which Michelle will present now. So thank you very much, Niall. So, so far we have drawn on historical household surveys to examine changes in rates of energy poverty and deprivation over the last 30 years and across various population groups. However, the most recent available information from these sources date from the 2015 household budget survey and the 2020 survey of income and living conditions. 
energy prices have risen considerably since then. This graph plots changes in selected sub-indices of the Consumer Price Index published by the CSO from 2015 until April 2022, indexed at their average 2015 price level. Whilst there has been some volatility in home heating oil prices, we observed that prices of electricity, natural gas and solid fuels remained quite stable from 2015 to 2020. Home heating oil prices fell considerably in 2020, coinciding with the COVID-19 pandemic and the reduced demand for oil associated with that. However, there has been a sharp increase in prices of all energy sources since April 2021, with home heating oil prices as of April 2022, 86% higher than in 2015. Also, in April 2022, electricity prices were up 45%, natural gas prices were up 53%, and solid fuels were up 32% over their 2015 price levels. So in order to estimate the impact of these and also future price increases, we modelled expenditure share on energy goods and services in the 2015 to 2016 household budget survey using household and demographic characteristics. We then used this model to predict households expenditure on energy in the data used in the SWITCH model, which is the SRI's tax and benefit micro simulation model. SWITCH currently uses the 2019 SILC data operated to 2022 terms. This allows us to investigate the impact of recent and future price increases on households accounting for changes in income. We simulate the impact of two sets of price increases. First, we look at the recent price increases from January 2021 to April 2022, based on the CPI sub-indices uh, increases I went through on the previous slide. We also simulate a potential further 25% increase in prices. A 25% increase was selected for illustrative purposes, but informed by the anticipated rise in energy prices in May. So here uh, are our estimates of the average impact of energy price increases from January 2021 to April 2022. The red bar shows the impact in terms of euros per week on the left-hand axis, while the connected dots show the impact uh, as a percentage of disposable income. The red series incorporates the impact of just home heating and electricity inflation and shows that price increases amount to an average of 21 euro per week or 2.3% of disposable income across all households. The orange series also includes the impact of rising motor fuel prices, which increase the cost of energy inflation to an average of 39 euro per week or 4.2% of disposable income across all households. The orange series, um, so we observe a strong income gradient in the impact of energy price increases. For example, we estimate that recent increases in energy costs, including motor fuels, amount to 5.9% of after-tax and transfer income for the lowest income fifth of households, compared to 3.1% for the highest income fifth. This is because a larger share of lower income households spending is on energy, particularly home heating and electricity. A similar gradient is evident in terms of other population groups, with those at risk of poverty, households in rural areas and homeowners more affected as a proportion of their disposable incomes. This is in part because these groups tend to have lower incomes and in part because more of their overall spending goes towards these types of goods. So here we see the impact if energy prices rise by a further 25%. This would increase expenditure share by an average of 37 euro per week, excluding motor fuels, or 68 euro per week if they are included. Again, although the magnitude of the effect has increased, we observe a strong income gradient. With those in the lowest income quintile and those at risk of poverty most affected by future price increases. So well, now I turn to our estimates of the impact of present and future energy price prices on energy poverty. As previously defined by Nile, a household is considered to be experiencing energy poverty if they are spending more than 10% of their net income on energy. We estimate that expenditure-based energy poverty, including electricity, has risen from 13.2% in 2015 to 2016 to 29.4% in April 2022. 
This leaves energy poverty rate above its previous recorded high of 23% in 1994 and 1995. We also simulate the impact of a further 25% increase in energy prices. This would lead to a further substantial increase in energy poverty, leaving 43% of households experiencing energy poverty and far exceeding previously recorded highs. Now, Barra is going to talk you through some of the policy responses. Thanks very much, Michelle. Um, so I am just going to talk you through now some of the, the options, I suppose, that we kind of go through that the government might consider in thinking about how to respond to these price increases that Michelle has talked you through. Uh, and, and also bearing in mind, I suppose, what, what Niall has shown you earlier about uh, the different groups who are at risk. So first, you know, the, broadly speaking, there's kind of three approaches which have been talked about. So there's cuts to indirect taxes, those taxes like VAT uh, on, on, on electricity and energy also excise duties on, on motor fuels or the, the carbon tax. These are all kind of indirect taxes on, on those kind of goods. That's one option that's been talked about. But there's also then been, I suppose, increases to welfare payments being talked about and lump sum payments like the household electricity credit. And then there's a set of kind of more uh, income uh, uh, tax cuts. So I'm going to go through those in, in turn. And I suppose the point that we make broadly about indirect tax cuts is that w as well as having the impact of blunting the, I suppose, incentives that are, 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 are shown by the increased prices to for the economy as a whole to move away from fossil fuels and to invest in um, uh, in energy saving technology and behavior indirect tax cuts are also quite poorly targeted at the worst affected households and what i mean by that is what i'm going to show you on this graph here which is again just taking kind of the same groups that michelle just talked you through but now looking at the impact again using switch the esri tax and benefit micro simulation model uh, uh, to, to model the impact of various policy changes so what I have here is, is in red, a VAT cut. Again, the bar is showing in euro per week and, and the, the line showing in uh, as percent of disposable after tax and welfare income. Then we've got getting rid of the carbon tax on heating oil, which is the blue bar here. Uh, and then we've got cuts to fuel duties, which again is the, is the, the orange bar and, and, and the orange dot. Um, each of the, the, here I'm showing the impact on, on households and you see that for, for two of them, the impact is a little over 150 a, a, a week. Um, in terms of the, the uh, cash figure, and, and it, it's lower, it's um, uh, about, about 0.2% uh, uh, of disposable income. So quite small relative also to the increases that you've just been see seeing. And that's something worth bearing in mind for all of these changes is that, you know, the, the, the magnitude of them really doesn't go, go anywhere close to what, 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 what the impact of price changes have been. But you can see that, you know, across households as a whole, that's what those measures would do. There's additionally, particularly for these measures, there's an additional cost uh, uh, to them in terms of revenue foregone uh, as many businesses would be able to avail of them and and so they're kind of you know the measures I'm going to then show you subsequently are kind of of a similar cost but some of the cost I suppose is incurred by supporting businesses uh, um, uh, through through cuts for example on fuel and heating uh, oil that they might use but so what we see is that, that that's the average impact on households and what we see then in terms of when we look across these uh, the income distribution again with households here split up into five equally sized groups or quintiles lowest income on the left highest income on the right and what you can see is that while there's a percentage of income the the the, the support for each of these measures is just about downward sloping there's kind of it's not a particularly sharp gradient but it kind of does with the exception maybe the cuts to fuel duties provide a little bit more support for percent of income to low income households you can see from the bars that really you know the the cash gains are largest at the top of the distribution and this is really what i suppose we're pointing out is that while you do provide proportionally uh, a little bit more support to lower income households the actual the vast bulk of the, the spending from this of the revenue foregone goes towards the higher income households and this is simply because these are households who will tend to have larger houses and so spend more on heating but also as you can kind of see from the difference in i suppose the patterns across these uh, uh, bars higher income households also tend to drive more they tend to you know uh, uh, to, to go more places i suppose and to go more places by car so again while you know this is kind of the reason that we we, we kind of point out that these indirect tax cuts as well as having those uh, i suppose uh, other effects on in terms of incentives to to, to change behavior and to invest in new technology in addition to that, they really are not particularly well targeted in that the vast, the, the, the good majority of the, the revenue that is being spent on them goes towards helping those who, as Michelle has shown you, uh, uh, were, were less, have been least affected uh, um, by the, 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 the changes in, um, uh, in prices recently. 
we can also look at the same and look at the gradient of these measures across uh, th those who are at risk of poverty. So that's below the, the poverty line defined as 60% of median household income. And you can see that, you know, here again, the, 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 you can see that, uh, that, that the, uh, um, and this group is as well much larger, but the average gain in cash terms and so aggregate terms is much more for this group. And so, so again, that same point kind of applies. They're, they're rural urban, there's, the, you know, the, there's, there's less differences. And then for between those who are renters, not there, there's a, uh, not really a lot of difference there at all. But so uh, why am I showing you this on the, kind of this kind of scales? Because what I want to show you now is, well, what if instead you did something similarly uh, costly, I suppose, in terms of the revenue for gone, but instead you did it through the welfare system. So we, this is what I'm showing here. And what I'm showing you in red is a, a social welfare bonus. That's kind of like the Christmas bonus paid, uh, uh, um, you know, a double payment of welfare payments. That That's some that the state tends to do each year and to make a double payment in run to Christmas and so you could very readily I suppose do the same in autumn uh, um, when, when bills start to come due. You could also double the fuel allowance that's what's shown here with the blue bars and the blue lines and then also there's the, the 120 uh, euro uh, electricity credit uh, um, which, which, which has been previously done and is more a lump sum payment and you can see that by from the orange bars and the fact that they're flat across the income uh, quintiles. But again so each of these measures kind of similar cost to it, but really the big thing to notice here and the difference with what I just showed you on the indirect tax slide is while th th that there's a much sharper gradient uh, in terms of the per percent of disposable income across the uh, the income distribution where lowest income households gain by much more and you can see there you know in terms of this about 1.5 percent for the doubling of fuel allowance uh, about 1.2 percent for social welfare bonus and then about uh, 0.6 percent uh, for for the, the 120 euro energy credit but you, you, you get both the cash gains and the percentage gains being largest for those lowest income households. So again, this is really about the point about targeting is that for a given cost of a package, much more of that support is going towards those who've been most uh, most affected. Uh, and also additionally, and this is the, the, I suppose the important point as well, while preserving those incentives to, to uh, invest in energy saving technology and behavior, because you're not changing, I suppose, the, the price, whereas, you know, cutting VAT on fuel acts as an effective fossil fuel subsidy, something that you know, government said they want to try and move away from, that's not the case by giving transfers because you're essentially boosting people's income. And while they might well spend it on energy, they don't have to. And you, you maintain the economy-wide incentives for those who are able to switch away from uh, fossil fuels to do so while also supporting those who may be not able to do so as well. So again, in terms of those at risk of poverty, you can see it's much more targeted on them, that the, the cash gain, both the cash gains and the percentage gains are much more. There, there's a little bit more towards the rural and urban, and that kind of in part reflects the, the fact that maybe the demographics of many of those who would benefit from particularly the fuel allowance would be older households and they disproportionately live in, in, in rural areas. Um, and, and then uh, uh, for, for renters, it varies a bit between the measures, but actually you can see the 120 euro energy credit um, because renters tend to have lower incomes on average is a little bit more for renters than it is for homeowners. Um, one thing just to add here, I suppose, on, on, on maybe the, the, one of the differences between the social welfare bonus and the doubling of the fuel allowance is while they're very similar in terms of the average impact, um, the fuel allowance is only uh, uh, um, received by those who've been in receipt of certain welfare payments more than 12 months. So one thing, I suppose, with the fuel allowance, uh, uh, unless the eligibility conditions are, are, are changed and, and, and I suppose eligibility expanded, is that you kind of miss out on those who've been recently unemployed in the last 12 months, for example. And there might still be many of those who maybe lost uh, their, their, their job during the, the pandemic and who haven't yet moved, you know, are looking at moving into a different sector uh, or, or maybe they've gone back to education. And they mightn't be necessarily uh, eligible for, I suppose, the, the, the fuel allowance where they might for a, a social welfare bonus or might be more, would be more likely to, particularly those who have recently lost their jobs. So that's on the welfare side of things. And again, that's really just to illustrate the point that, that it's much more targeted, it's much more focused on those who have been most uh, adversely affected. Um, there's also been some discussion of, of, of tax changes. And again, the, you know, it, it, what I suppose we're really pointing out is that, you know, if, if the group that you want to support most are those who have been most adversely affected, that the welfare increases uh, and lump sum payments kind of seem to be the way to go. But there's also reasons the government want, might want to favour other groups who might want to spread out the, 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 the support wider, might want to include those on middle incomes. And so in which case, actually something that's well targeted towards those middle uh, and, and upper middle incomes is more, I suppose, changes to the, the tax system, both in terms of the PRSI credit, so that we're modelling a, a change and expansion in the eligibility of that there, and also in the income tax credit, so the PAY or personal income tax credit here that, uh, that, that kind of uh, you, you apply against any income tax. And, and really kind of the pattern that you see here is, again, similar overall impact. Really what, what you can, I suppose you can see is that whereas for income tax cuts, really in, in cash terms and even proportionally, most of the gain there is going to middle income and upper middle uh, in, income uh, households. 
PRSI credit is a bit more focused towards low, lower middle income households. And the reason for that is essentially you start to pay PRSI before you pay uh, um, income tax. And that's what kind of drives that pattern. Um, you can see here, though, again, both in proportion terms and, and, uh, and cash terms, more of the support from such a measure goes to those who aren't at risk of poverty. It's fairly evenly split between rural and urban. However, and that's kind of one of the interesting things, that the PRSI credit is a lot more focused towards renters. And the reason for this being that many renters uh, um, are, are younger adults who tend to have lower levels of earnings. And so they do benefit disproportionately from an increase in the PRSI credit than, say, an increase in the income tax credit. So that gives you kind of a flavour of, of, of some of the types of things you can do. And there's lots of variants of this you could do. And of course, you know, as, as I mentioned earlier on, the scale here that I've shown you is much smaller then I suppose the, the impact of recent price increases. But most of these changes should be scalable, particularly in terms of the welfare uh, side of things. So if you did want to do some of these measures, you know, you, you say, for example, the, the, the um, Christmas bonus style payment, you could do that multiple times through the year if you wanted. You could do that in, in maybe the autumn and the spring when those high bills are landing. That, that kind of is a quite an attractive feature of it, that it can be timed as a lump sum to land in when those bills are landing in. Uh, and, and so therefore maybe not necessarily require households to put aside a bit each week to, 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 to um, pay for those bills, but rather, you know, have, have that come through as an extra lump sum at a particular point in time. Um, but, but again, so most of these are scalable, uh, 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 w w so, so you can kind of take larger increases or the, these patterns as reflective of larger increases as well, if that's what you wanted to, to do. Um, but just to kind of conclude then, wrap this all together. So as Niall showed you, energy poverty and deprivation was kind of falling until recently. And that's really been then, as Michelle showed you, reversed by the price increases in the last 18 months, which have affected lower income households and, and those already at risk of poverty or deprivation more than, than higher income households uh, and those not at risk of poverty and deprivation. The point we make in the report is really that there are limits to what the government can do. Uh, and and you know, the, one of the reasons for that is if you were to take some of the losses that, that we model to, in fact, go through and compensate everyone for all the losses they've seen would require expenditure in the billions, upwards of four billion. Uh, to, to, to compensate those households. And so given the potential, you know, if you were to do that, that would bring with it a risk of fueling further non-energy inflation in the way that the Governor Central Bank has talked about before and also IFAC and my colleagues at, at the SRI and the macroeconomics team. And so that kind of makes it just particularly important to target that support, that if you want to mitigate the risk of fueling further non-energy inflation, it, it, targeting those supports is really key, uh, uh, given the limits to what government can do. Um, so uh, as well as mitigating the risk of fueling further non-energy inflation, uh, 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 um, that, that, that's kind of make, the case for really targeting those supports, I suppose. Um, we, what I just talked you through there is that as well as weakening incentives to invest in kind of maybe green or energy saving technologies, indirect tax cuts are poorly targeted at the, those being worst affected by recent price increases, whereas increases to welfare and even lump sum payments like the household electricity credit, which is really just spread across the population as a whole, both of those are better, both better targeted, but they also avoid blunting the incentives, which are really important if we are to reach those really demanding climate objectives which have been set. Finally, thing I'll finish up with, and I'll kind of mention this earlier on, is the need for better and more regular data and just how key that is. So this exercise we, we, we kind of undertook in particular because I suppose, particularly in terms of energy poverty, th those last collected figures on household expenditure were back in 2015, 16. So there really was a, a data gap there. And what we tried to do, I suppose, was uh, in part of this exercise was to address that data gap. But that's something that'll be great to see kind of into the future that we have more regularly collected data on household expenditure. It, at the, it has been historically only every five years and that got delayed a bit during the pandemic. The CSO are currently in the field collecting a new household budget survey. Uh, and, but something that, you know, we need more than just information on households' incomes. We need information on their expenditure and, and if we're to get a more full picture of their living standards. And having that more regular data and having, having that better data is really, really key and, and, and is crucial to, I suppose, our mission here at the SRI of providing evidence for policy. So that's where I'll finish up. Uh, thanks very much uh, to, to everyone for coming along and in particular to the Community Foundation for Ireland for their generous support in, in, in funding this work. And we look forward to taking your questions now. Great. Uh, thanks so much, Barra. So I'm going to in, invite uh, Michelle and I'll uh, to join us again. Um, and I'm going to invite uh, folks to submit questions through the Q&A function. Uh, but I'm, I'm going to kick off with a couple of questions uh, myself, if I might. And um, OK, so the, the, the spirit of the first one, I, I, I understand that the energy difficulties that everybody's facing at the moment is the short term. Uh, you know, it's an immediate uh, crisis. Um, but, but what about the, the sort of efforts uh, to sort of retrofit the homes of, of low income people? Um, how well are we doing, OK, in, in, in terms of 
directing resources, if I can put it like that, uh, towards retrofits. It's, it, it's a, a very sort of layperson's view, uh, but retrofits seem extremely expensive. Uh, they almost sort of seem to be a you know a middle class pursuit. Uh, if I know, I, I might be getting this wrong. This is purely impressionistic. Uh, but but I'd be interested to get a sense of in that spirit of sort of targeting resources. Um, you you've talked about it primarily in terms of you know welfare payments, and that's all very sensible. But what about targeting resources in terms of the grants and the supports that are required? Uh, to, to, to make sure that low income people are able to av avail of the sort of energy uh, saving issues. And I mean, that's in terms of retrofits. Um, it, if I started talking about EVs, I mean, EVs just sort of seem totally beyond uh, the reach of lower income people. So I don't know, can somebody um, pick up that issue? Yeah, sure. Um, well, I suppose like when it comes to policy interventions with regard to retrofits there is an effort to try and target to the households who are energy poor the big question is how it, identifying those who are energy poor and it's it's uh, there's many ways to consider it and to define it and um, so that's that's one issue and as Dar as Barra was saying uh, getting the data to try and understand who exactly like trying to identify who these households are and trying to target the interventions towards those households is is quite um a difficult task and one thing that is ongoing and um, with colleagues here at the SRI is to try and link different data sets to try and better get a better handle on that so that that can give you the information of household energy expenditures related to household energy efficiency which is a really difficult thing to get together and once you have that information together then you can better understand who how, how we target it to, to to um to the, to the energy poor so that's that's yeah it, it that's something that definitely there's room, there's room for from over there, I think. Um, I might just add one thing, Alan, maybe on, on just electric vehicles, as my dog frantically tries to get out the door and it's making lots of noise. Apologies to people. Um, so I, I suppose one of the things that's going to be key potentially there is the, um, the design of any scrappage schemes. So scrappage schemes are the type of things that are, I suppose, often in, uh, introduced or were introduced in the Great Recession or in the aftermath of that and something that's been talked about. I suppose one thing that you can do there is, is to, to try direct that scheme such that it, 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 I suppose, provides the greatest support to those who have the dirtiest vehicles, because those are the vehicles you want to get off the road. And now you, there, there, there is likely that that's going to be correlated a bit, I suppose, with people with lower incomes, people, and, and in that targeting sense, I suppose, that you're talking about there. So having a clever design around that such a kind of scrappage scheme so that you're you, you may be looking that if, if such a scheme is introduced that you're looking at doing it in such a way which promotes uh, I suppose the, the best uh, uh, the, the getting those clunkiest and dirtiest cars off the road and that I think is going to have an element of, of, of that kind of targeted sport in there it's not going to be perfect but it's going to be one way of doing it which both makes I suppose kind of climate sense if you like while also maybe maybe being able to minimize the dead weight because as you say the uh, well I might leave it there given that the, the dog might, might want to try get in on that if I continue on much like <laughs> okay, well, well, Barra deals with the dog. Um, actually, I, apologies, Barra, but we're, we're going to need you for the next uh, question. So I, I, I think generally uh, somebody's asking a question about entitlement to the, uh, the Christmas bonus. Okay, so I suppose the question is, and, and just to add to it, you know, who on social welfare is entitled to the Christmas bonus? But more importantly, um, do you know... It, it, you know the way, for example, uh, say somebody is on a uh, contributory pension, but they can get a living alone allowance. Uh, does a does the Christmas bonus type uh, approach to this? Do, do you get your ex exactly the same welfare payment that that you typically get? You know, um, on on that one off basis. So are, are all the these sort of additional uh, minor payments included in the package? So that it's it, you know you, you, in, in a particular week you're you're literally getting twice what you previously had. Yeah, so I suppose uh, the, the the conditions are, are are complex, and thankfully this information website gives it gives a full list of them. But I suppose really what what you know what I suppose we're saying in terms of the Christmas pay, uh, bonus style payment is that we know and we do regularly make double payments of welfare payments at, at Christmas when when you know we think expenses are going to be in. High uh, and 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 or people might be particularly pressed. And we want to provide that support, and so you can kind of tailor it however however you like, right? So so whether you do it exactly as the Christmas bonus is done, where there are some, as he's going to say, some restrictions, or whether you you do that more expansively, that, that there there's I think that kind of just provides a nice model, and again one which is quite well suited to um, 
addressing sort of energy bills when they're going to land in a lump sum. So in a way, like another way of doing this and, and actually kind of an equivalent, we'll have an equivalent distributional pattern to what, what we showed would be uh, about a 2%, I think, increase in all rates of welfare payment, right? So that would have the same distributional pattern. But what you would require households to do, I suppose, is put aside a little bit each week to, to, uh, uh, to pay that bill when it comes in. Whereas again, with that kind of bonus payment more kind of approach, what that does mean is that you have that money landing in people's accounts at the same time as, as maybe the bills are coming due. And you can kind of target it towards that maybe peak when you know people get the, the, the bill from the, the, the January, February, March period, and when they get that bill kind of coming into the winter as well. And so that's maybe kind of, again, really, I suppose, one of the, the, the nice features that that has. And I suppose, again, the, the, the fuel allowance ha it has that kind of logic in mind. It's not paid through the year, it's paid for a certain period. And again, that really is because we know these bills don't just, you know, they, they, they don't come in steadily through the year unless you, you can manage to, 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 I suppose, do your meter in that way. But so, so, so really that, that's kind of, I suppose, the, the, the key bit there is that, you know, you can, you can fiddle around with the precise eligibility criteria, but it's really doing that kind of lump sum, pay, that payment that comes in as a, 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 when, it, when it's kind of really needed, that has a real kind of attraction to it from that point of view. And then also pointing out, I suppose, that the fuel allowance, well, again, that, that's the spirit that is kind of, I suppose, designed in. But at the moment, it's kind of mostly restricted to those longer term payment uh, claimants. So what, what we showed, and I suppose, in our modelling was just doubling everyone's payments. We weren't maybe doing precisely the, the, the limitations that are put with the, uh, with the Christmas bonus. But again, showing that's the type of thing one could do if, if, if you want to really target that sport, both to the people maybe and when it's needed. Okay, so Neve Kelly from One Family has it's it's essentially a related uh, question, and you may have touched on some of the issues already. Uh, but Neve has, is there a preferred mechanism via social welfare? Okay, for example, lump, energy lump sum versus fuel allowance versus bonus payment, and and but prompting your question, given some lower income households such as those on the working uh, family payment aren't eligible for the fuel allowance. Yeah, and I suppose that, that that's quite an important point and something that we had research, uh, ESRI research launch earlier in the week, pointing to, I suppose, just how powerful the working families payment, formerly known as the family income supplement, is in terms of its poverty reduction. It really targeted at those households who are uh, are low income, working poor. So and, and, and you know, it, it's available to those who work more than 20 hours a week, essentially, and are on low pay and have kids. That That's the kind of group who are particularly get that working families payment. And it, it really is a powerful anti-poverty tool. From that point of view, because it it, it, it it gets at the uh, at that group of people who are in and around the poverty line, and, and but then as the question was said, like there are with things like the the um, fuel allowance, that's not net, those recipients who are who are many of them very hard pressed don't necessarily get the support. So again, doing doing kind of a, a double payment style approach is is, is kind of has that the attraction there, and you can bring that group in, and that's going to 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 I suppose uh, boost that group. Just maybe to to reiterate a point again that was made earlier in the week, I suppose in terms of the the design of the welfare system. Um, so Ireland kind of stands out a little bit in those without kids who are in low paid employment, not having access to something like the working families payment. And that's something that's been flagged by a number of bodies like NESC, uh, uh, um, uh, at the National Economic and Social uh, Council, along with research from, from, from uh, colleagues of ours at the ESRI uh, about perhaps looking at extending that and, and that if one is minded to try, uh, uh, try mitigate, I suppose, poverty, uh, among that, 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 that is quite again quite a powerful tool, and extending it out to those without kids ha has has quite a, a lot of uh, attractions from that point of view. Okay, it's uh, funny you'd mention uh, Nets because Anne Marie McGowan has uh, submitted a question, and Anne Marie's question is: Are there particular supports which could be targeted to those with prepaid meters? So, and uh, Anne Marie adds: I've heard that the rates charged are higher for prepaid meters. If that is the case, uh, is there a role for the energy companies? Just thinking about that off the top of my head, uh, I would be reluctant to maybe, like if, if you think it through and you give a special rate for somebody on a prepaid meter, that could create, there's a danger, it could create a perverse incentive that somebody might then want to move on to a prepaid meter that wouldn't otherwise do so. The question I would ask is, uh, why is it that people are on prepaid meters and maybe there's a reason why you're, you, um, you feel like, or like, like you're on that. So is there a way to get people to switch? Or do people need help to switch? And maybe that's where that could be targeted or some sort of intervention along those lines because uh, that, that, that might, might, be, might be helpful for that. For that. Okay, uh, another question to you, Barra. Uh, well, uh, to the, the team, but I'm, I'm, it, it came out of Barra as part of the presentation. Um, so there's an argument of doing the Christmas bonus payment for welfare recipients and doing it quickly. 
Okay, but a lot of the things you talked about in terms of, uh, I hate using the phrase the squeeze middle, okay, because it's not well defined, but to the extent that some of the, the tax changes you were looking at were, were about uh, maybe lower income groups, people, people in work. Uh, but it seems we'd have to wait for the budget for those things to happen. Okay, and that would be the budget in October and sometimes the tax changes don't kick in. So, I mean, are, are you implicitly saying that there should be a sort of a mini budget or an emergency budget? Or what, what's your, your take on that issue? Um, well, so when they do the Christmas bonus, usually that, that sometimes require, I mean, what, what is a mini budget, I suppose, would be, be the question is, you know, we have many announcements now through the year, which in terms of magnitude might have qualified as mini budgets before, but they aren't described as that. As that. So when, when you see the winter fuel, uh, sorry, the, the Christmas bonus paid uh, generally, sometimes it requires uh, um, a supplementary estimate to be brought through the House of the Roctus. Sometimes it doesn't. It depends on whether there's been overspends or underspends elsewhere. Um, so one could potentially do it without having to have anything that looks like a budget, even any kind of financial resolutions or, or, or the like. One might require it depending on what, what, what position uh, and how much expenditure there's been. But so, I, you know, I'm not sure it necessarily matters whether you call it a mini budget or not. It, it's, it, 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 it could, it, it, I mean, in a way that's just, that, that's just, that, that's just what a tag for it. Um, um, but I suppose really, again, the, the question for the government is, when does it want the support to land in for people? And if it wants it to land in for people before, say, January next year, then a Christmas bonus payment offers the way of maybe doing that without having to wait to, to, to bring through all the resolutions to increase rates of welfare payment and all, and all the rest. Uh, um, but again, it could also do it through a mini budget if it's if it's off it. it that, that, that's, I suppose, really one more for, for in terms of the framing or communications of, of, of the measures rather than necessarily the substance. Okay, uh, now uh, Connor Barry has, has submitted a, um, a a comment. It's, a, it's actually it was picking up on a, a, a point I made about uh, poorer people not being able to access EVs, and Connor um, quite correctly picks up on the point actually uh, that transport at, at lower uh, incomes is not actually about uh, cars at all. It's not making a transition from one car to another, as a, a lot of lower income people don't. And that's actually a, a perfectly valid point. Uh, and kind of raised the interesting question then about uh, public transport fare reductions uh, as, as another mechanism uh, for, in a sense, insulating people from, now I know it's, now we're moving on to transport uh, side of it, uh, but, um, across the group again, is is that a, a, a policy prescription that that you would see as fitting into that distributionally positive? Zone? Sure. So, there, so maybe two things there. So, yeah, as, as you mentioned, and, and Connor's I suppose comes from Connor's comments, and and you kind of see that in, in what I showed you about the fuel duty cuts, right? Both in cash terms as a percentage, you saw most of the gain uh, and the highest gain goes to higher income households, and that's because they're disproportionately likely to drive and drive far. So, uh, yeah, as Connor says, there's many many low income families don't actually. Uh, have a car nor use it very often. The flip side of that means that the public transport cuts actually again have share some of those. The, 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 uh, you think you can make apply the same uh, points about them in terms of the, the lack of targeting that you do the indirect tax fuel cuts. However, with the caveat that there's some stats out from CSO during the week showing that there does seem to be a big increase in public transport uh, um, usage at the moment, and that's not really then something that we have information on. Who are the additional people who are using it? So we don't really know, is it lower income, or higher income, middle income people or who, who are the, the new public transport users, if you like. But I think that'll be a really uh, interesting thing to explore and, and, and hopefully something that we at the Institute, if given data to, will be able to look into and provide uh, uh, evidence about. Just to add to that, yeah. Um, yes. no, yeah, no, definitely would agree with Barra. But one other thing that comes to mind on that is that uh, if we want to widen public transport and access to public transport, the big a big aspect of that is like the last mile getting to and from the, 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 the access to public transport and uh, facilitating that. And if that can be unlocked, that could widen out accessibility and therefore uh, adoption amongst uh, yeah, those who are less well off. No, and, and also in uh, Conor Barry's comment, um, re reflection on uh, tax breaks for bikes, um, which again, a very interesting one. It's a tax break I availed of myself, uh, I have to say, and did at the time wonder why is the government helping me to buy a bike? Uh, so it was welcome, but um, it, it, uh, it, I, I, I did feel almost uh, slightly guilty in a, fis I, I, in a fiscal way uh, as I took well, advantage of the subsidy. I, I, as someone who's taken advantage of a more British taxpayer subsidy to get multiple bikes than that when I was living over there, I feel less guilty. But however, uh, what, one thing I think is going to maybe an interesting thing to think about and, and going back to maybe the, the scrappage scheme idea is if, again, if, as is talked about, sometimes the government looks towards a scrappage scheme, actually not you know having that transport mode 
neutral, I suppose, in, extent, in a way might be interesting. So maybe shouldn't maybe shouldn't be that just if you get rid of your car, you get money off a new car. Maybe it should be get rid, get rid of your car and get off a e-bike or e-cargo bike. Given the, there is a much greater degree of substitutability with increase in technology, I think anyone who's used one of those recently uh, will kind of know that it, it can really, particularly in, in I suppose, ur urban, suburban areas, replace uh, 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 quite a lot of car usage. So, you know, if, if that, that's maybe one angle that can be looked at, maybe improved on rather than necessarily myself, yourself, Alan, getting a fancy, fancier bike that, than we might have otherwise gotten. Indeed. OK, we might take one more uh, question. This is from Claire O'Connor. Um, and Claire is asking, have links been identified between building BER and energy poverty? So I don't know, Niall, is that something you would know something about? Sure, yeah. So like the big issue here is that it's very hard to get data sets that have information on BER rating and energy poverty together. Um, they tend to be sort of this, but this, like this different uh, data. So like what we discussed today, for example, we used household budget survey and sort of an income and living conditions. They, they give you really good data on what people spend and people's incomes and all that sort of stuff, but they don't tell you what the BER is of their house. Now, there's work ongoing to try and link that data with the BER, and then you can get an in insight into, well, to what extent are certain BER levels and certain types of insulation, like you can get really good data on what the, what the wall insulation is like, the windows, all these sort of things, and break it down to this sort of house household tends to have this sort of type of BER rating on just this level of, of, of home insulation. And then you can identify, well, who what sort of households should we be targeting if we don't necessarily know their BER uh, for, for energy poverty type type interventions? Yeah, so I, I don't know if Claire uh, meant to tee up a plea for better data, uh, but uh, as, as Niall says, that's something we have been discussing uh, with the CSO uh, through data linkage. Uh, there's probably more we could do in this uh, area. So great, great to have the opportunity to, uh, to plug that once again. Okay, well, look, we're, we're coming close uh, to 11 o'clock and we did say we would uh, wrap things up by 11. So at, at this point, I'm just going to, again, thank and congratulate Baron Isle and Michelle for excellent, an excellent report and excellent uh, presentations. Uh, thank uh, it, Denise and the Community Foundation again uh, for supporting this work. Thank everybody for logging on this morning. And uh, with that, uh, bring the webinar to a close. So we look forward to seeing everybody again soon. Bye-bye.